Good evening. Hello. Great to see you as you're finding seats. Um, my name is Stephen Demetrio. I'm the youth minister here at Bishop Paddington Church. It is lovely to see everyone here. Nice to have live stream people with us as well. Let's pray as we start our, our evening service together. Father God, thank you so much that you are alive, that you are powerful, that you are awesome. And we pray tonight that we get to glimpse more of your character, more of your faithfulness, more of your goodness, and learn to trust you. Amen. Uh, we're looking at Joshua. Uh, we're into the third part of Joshua. Just a kind of recap of, of Joshua. Um, it's Old Testament. It's like thousands of years ago, uh, and it's the true history of God's people. So currently, they're kind of encamped next to a big old river, about to cross into the land that's been promised to them by God. And we're going to find out what happens next in the story t- today. Um, but, but kind of at small group, we've been uh, learning a memory verse that sums up the whole of the book of Joshua. Um, there's one verse in Joshua which kind of sums it all up. It's going to be on the screens now. Um, there it is. Not one of all of the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. Because Joshua is kind of all about, well, not Joshua, but about the faithful God who works through Joshua and who answers and fulfills and comes good on all his promises he makes. So I thought we'd learn this together as a church family too tonight. So we're going to come back to it over and over again through the service. Um, that sound good? A bit of interaction, nice. That, that's always helpful. <laughs> let's, uh, let's, let's say it together. Hopefully there'll be a bit, bit more energy than, uh, than that last question. Um, so together, let's say, not one of all the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. Say it again. Not one of all of the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. We're going to stand and sing in a minute. Um, before that, we're going to say that once more. We're going to change the word Israel to us. Because if you're a Christian trusting Jesus, no matter how dark and bleak and difficult life gets, when we get to meet the Lord Jesus, we will look back and say those words knowing that that's true, knowing that, that, that God's been good all the way through. That's really cool, isn't it? So let's stand and say that as us, not Israel, and then the band will start playing and we'll start our first song. Let's stand together. Together. Not one of all the Lord's good promises to us failed. Everyone was fulfilled.
do take a seat. Isn't that true? Like God is faithful to all his promises and he's good. Um, we kind of had our eyes looking at God. Uh, and then we kind of compare ourselves to him. And man, we fall short, don't we? <laughs> when you look at the almighty God who's good and faithful and, and, and keeps all his promises, oh, yeah, we don't kind of meet up to his, his beautiful standard. And so that's why it's good for us as a church family to, to say sorry, to confess. That's what we're kind of moving into now, a time of, uh, of confessing. And as we do this, we're, we're going to say some words together. And then the point of it is to look at ourselves and see our sinfulness. That's what the Bible calls like falling short of God's standard. And then as we do look at ourselves, our eyes are meant to bounce up and look at God's faithfulness and see that difference. And we say sorry, we confess. So the words will appear on the screen. And... Um, We'll say these words together. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have wandered and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things that we ought to have done, and we have done those things that we ought not to have done and there is no health in us. But you, O Lord, have mercy upon our sins. Spare those who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent, according to your promises declared to mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may live a disciplined, righteous, and godly life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Take a big, massive, deep breath. And let it go. That's kind of what confession's like for Christians. It's like that, that letting go, that, that, that relief, that, that beautiful freedom of forgiveness. Because, because in the Bible, God promises a way to save us from sins, and that promise is fulfilled in Jesus. So let's say our memory verse again. Then we'll go into a song which kind of tells the story of our, of, of like our salvation, of how God's taken us from being lost and found us. So we'll stand, we'll say those words again of Joshua 21, verse 45, and then we'll start singing. Not one of all the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Everyone was fulfilled.
let's just stay standing because we're going to say the words of the creed together because Jesus hasn't just saved us from our sins, but he's brought us into a brand new family. And we're going to say a family motto that, that glues us together as Christians. We're going to say we believe. It's a bit different to the I believe. Um, and we're going to talk about the Catholic Church, small c Catholic, which means whole, entire. It's been said throughout history, so it binds us to people of the past. Um, we're gluing ourselves to each other, to Christians across the world and throughout history. Let's say these words together. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Do take a seat. I love those words. Um, we are a church family, so we're going to share a bit of a church family news. Um, Clive Wilkins in the office, he loves telling us what day it is, what national day it is. So as a staff, we have celebrated National Backwards Day, National Opposite Day, and my personal favorite, National Chocolate Raisin Day. Um, now, now, I think Clive makes these up. These aren't real national days, surely not. Um, but, but one of our mission partners has made a brand new national day. Way. Thanks, Jacob. That was very exuberant. Um, <laughs> uh, it's called um, FE Sunday, uh, Further Education Sunday, and it's got a few purposes. Number one, to kind of inform us of what further education is about. Uh, two, so we can support and pray for students in further education, and three, so we can support and pray for Festive, the kind of mission partners who, who work with students in further education. So further education is kind of um, that, that awkward time when you finish school at 16 before 18 and kind of uh, where you're either apprenticing or kind of going to college or other kind of learning. Um, here in, at BH we have young people who are part of the Met, Plumpton, um, Newman College, uh, Basvik, um, Brighton College. Uh, we've got people um, doing apprenticeships as well. There's also Vanding, which is close. It's good to pray for that too. So those are kind of the local ones to be praying for. And it's kind of a difficult time because you've kind of moved from school and your safety and your security and you're in a brand new place most of the time. Uh, and it can be a difficult time for faith as well. It's good to be supporting and praying for these young people going through those, that transitional time. Um, if you want to know what to pray specifically, there's these cards which can be found right at the back by the, um, by the doors. Grab one of those to learn how to pray for our young people in those situations. But I want to piggyback off the back of that as well, because tomorrow, tomorrow um, is the official kind of start date of GCSEs, and a bit later on A-levels, uh, they have started already, some of them, but uh, it would be good to pray for our KO brothers and sisters as well I in that time, because it can be a scary time. Right? We all know the exam pressure and the, the kind of nerves and that stuff, so good to pray for them, and pray a few things. One, that, that kind of our guys and girls would know that these exams don't define them and kind of get that priorities right that God comes first that he's much more important than exams and good to pray number two that kind of um, when that if that stress and pressure does come that, they, that, that, that society kind of pushes on people that, that they know God's calm and peace um, and good to pray as well that they honour and glorify God through how they work because <laughs> Christians like we do everything for the glory of God even doing exams um, so I thought kind of we'd pray for those two things together and then Nigel will come and continue our prayers. Then we'll sing, then Wendy will read and Jacob will preach. Um, let's pray for our young people and uh, in further education. Father, thank you so much for the opportunities in this country to, to, to kind of, yeah, do that further education, do that, that, that next step after school. Thank you for those kind of in those colleges we've mentioned and, and the apprenticeships and things. Father, we want to pray for those young people. It's a hard environment to be a Christian. We pray that our young people would, would be bold and distinctive, would be finding other Christians to have fellowship with, would be navigating that well, Father God, and not feeling intense pressure or worry or fear about the future, but that, that, that calm trust in you. 
And for those starting exams over the next uh, few, few days, Father, um, or who've done some already, Father God, we, we ask and pray that that exam pressure would not be too much, that, Father, our young people would know that their definition doesn't come from what's on a bit of paper, but comes from being made in the image of the almighty God. That we pray that our guys and girls would, would know what like, order and priority to, to have things in and to work hard not to kind of boast in their achievements, but to honour and glorify you. Father, bless our young people through this next stage. Amen. Good evening. Thanks, Stephen. Um, as, I lead, as I lead our intercessions this evening, I'll be sharing um, prayers from the Prayer Mate app that's on my phone. Uh, I missed the meeting this morning with Ben about how to read and pray in church, so I hope that's allowed. But um, we will still pray anyway, uh, as we come to the God about whom we learned this morning, that while we want muffin, that is something, God does not need nothing, or not even good grammar. And so we pray. As we remember those in further education, we pray especially for our mission partners, Festive, who seek to equip and inspire gospel work in further education, as they support individual students and Christian unions around the country offering mentoring, encouragement, prayer and free resources. We pray for the evangelistic exam giveaway that they are sending out to Christian students to give to their non-Christian friends, asking that you will be at work through the literature in them and that they, the students, will start some gospel conversations. We also pray for festive finances as one of their major grants ends this summer, asking that other funding will come in and that they will see more people and churches become regular supporters of their work. And thanking you, Father, for the privilege that we as a church have had of standing with them from the early days of their ministry. We ask this in the name of him who needs nothing but gives everything, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our friends at the Barnabas Fund, who support persecuted church, persecuted church, ask us to pray today for Christian brothers and sisters facing isolation and extreme loneliness for the gospel's sake. We pray for those in prison, away from loved ones, those rejected from their families, and socially excluded because of their faith in you, even forced to leave their homeland. Please cause them to sense you drawing alongside them to counsel, to comfort, and to chart the course of their lives. While they may feel insignificant and unknown, may they be assured that they are known by you and encouraged that you have a plan for their lives. And as we keep our focus globally, we pray for peace to come to those areas facing war and hostility remembering the continuing situation in Ukraine, asking you to thwart the plans of those who seek evil and injustice. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. The organisation CARE has a prayer about exploitation for today. Lord of all, we pray that Christians and others across the world will never cease trying to end the vile trade of human trafficking. Please grant success to CARE's work in the UK's Parliaments and Northern Ireland Assembly and to organisations that support victims. And this leads us on to pray for our own government as it faces many challenges, including the Ukraine conflict, the cost of living crisis and issues of governance in Northern Ireland, amongst others. We ask that you would help all in authority to govern and make decisions with humility, integrity, and above all, a seeking after your face, and that we ourselves will know how best to play our part as responsible and caring citizens within the community you have placed us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And in our church's prayer diary today, we are encouraged to pray for Denise and we ask that you will keep her walking closely with you and that she would continue to bear faithful witness 
to you, to her family and friends. For Fran and Martin, that they will continue uh, with their responsibilities with Agape Italia, despite their respective health issues, and that you will help them and the leadership team make plans guided by you for the future leadership of the ministry in Italy. And in addition, we also pray for Camilla, asking for your presence and healing hand to be on her at this distressing time, and for peace and comfort for Roly, Molly and Freddie and their wider family, and that we as a church family will know how best we can support them. We pray for our dear brother Martin as he comes to the end of his earthly life, longing to be in your presence. We pray for peace, comfort and assurance for him and for his daughters, Jen, Hilary, Judith, Caroline and their families. And in a moment of silence, we can offer up a prayer for anyone known to us who has a particular need at this time. And we pray also for the family and friends of our dear brother and for me, a former colleague here on church staff, Ian. Especially remember, Hazel, as we come together tomorrow to give thanks for this mighty servant of God as he sought to preach the changeless word to a changing world. And in the midst of some of our heartache and distress as a church family, we thank you too for the joys which we can share. And we especially pray for Matt, Steph and Ember as they travel tomorrow to see some of, some of Steph's family, asking for safe travel and a real celebration as Steph's parents finally meet their lovely granddaughter. We pray these prayers for our church family to the Father, in the name of the Son, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And as we look more at Joshua this evening, we thank you for what is recorded in your word, the Bible, asking that you will speak to us through Jacob as we learn about the grace, protection, and faithfulness of the Lord our God, who is God in heaven above, and on the earth below. Amen.
Tonight's reading can be found in Joshua chapter 2, and if you want to use the Church Bible, that is page 216. That's Joshua chapter 2. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent out two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jacob was told, Look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy at the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gates were shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given this land to you, and the great fear of you has fallen on us that all of you who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did in Sihon and Gog, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts sank, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we what we are doing we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the lord gives us the land so she let them down by a rope through the window for the house she lived in was part of the city wall she said to them go to the hills so that the pursuers will not find you hide yourselves there for three days until they return and then go on your way now the men had said to her this oath You made us swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into your house. If any of them go outside your house into the street, their blood will be on their own heads. We will not be responsible. As for those who are in the house with you, their blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on them. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. So she sent them away, and they departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. When they left, they went into the hills and stayed there three days until the pursuers had searched all along the road and returned without finding them. The two men started back. They went down out of the hills forded the river and came to Joshua, son of Nun, and told them everything that had happened to them. They said to Joshua, The Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. Brilliant. Well, do keep that passage open um, and let's pray as we start. Lord, I pray that you would meet with each one of us this evening um, and you would speak to each one of us through your word and change us by your word. Amen. Amen. I was at someone's house for lunch a few months ago. I don't think this person is here. 
Um, they could be watching on the live stream. And after a lovely roast dinner, the chef brought out the pudding, which was a banoffee pie. And it was cut up and it was put in the dishes. But it had one fairly vital ingredient missing for a banoffee pie because you had the banana, you had the cream, you had the biscuit base, but it had no toffee. Effectively, it was a bano pie. Um, fortunately, somebody did realize quite quickly, and so the toffee came out in dishes, and then you sort of added it in. It was, um, very, it was a very nice pudding altogether. And the way that Joshua 2 is written as well is a little bit like that, because we're told the information in a very specific order. It's used throughout the chapter to ramp up the tension at points, and it tells us very deliberately what is happening. So this chapter comes last week. If you weren't here, we had Dan from uh, in Hove um, talking about Joshua 1, about Joshua being made the leader of Israel with that call, it was three times, I think, to be strong and courageous. And I wonder, before we had the reading just then, if you were thinking, oh, we're going to find out them going through the Jordan, uh, which actually comes next week. So if it comes next week, why do we get this seemingly random diversion from that? But hopefully tonight we'll see that Joshua 2 is linked together. We don't get tons of information about what Joshua does next, but we learn a lot about Israel and most importantly about God's faithfulness, which is running centrally through the passage. So four points this evening. The first one is much longer than the other three. Um, they're in the blue service sheet, if that'd be helpful for you. So the four points this evening, an Israelite spy thriller, God's grace in Rahab's conversion, God's protection in the escape, and then finally, the results of God's faithfulness. So let's dive in then at that first point of the Israelite spy thriller in verses 1 to 7. And I wonder what your reaction was to hearing the word spies in the Bible in verse 1. I don't know, some words you just sort of think that's a very unusual word for the Bible. And you might have coming into your mind sort of images maybe of spy films, maybe of James Bond, maybe of Jason Bourne, or maybe perhaps Johnny English, um, depending on your outlook on films. But we get those spies which are sent out in verse 1 we get bits of a spy novel in that narrative. But if we were reading the first few verses of Joshua, it would be quite convoluted as a novel. That's why that there's that question mark of thriller, not an exclamation mark, because we don't know the spies' names. They don't do too much spying in the chapter. And spying has a history of going wrong. And Joshua's got personal experience of this. I wonder if you remember two weeks ago when Don, or Don's alter ego, I think, came down here and talked about how Moses had sent out spies previously. We can read about it in Numbers 13 and 14. So 12 spies get sent out to survey Canaan. 10 don't think they can invade, and the people rebel. So God sends a plague down, and delays their entry to the promised land by 40 years. It's only then, it's only Joshua and Caleb who realize it's by God's power that they would have been able to take the land. And so with that history of spying going wrong, Joshua, who's now the leader of Israel, knows that God will deliver the land into Israel's hands because God's already promised the land, but he doesn't know how that's going to happen yet. And so Joshua needs some intel. So what does he do? He sends the spies out in verse 1. He's got real concern for his people here. He's not sort of going and invading on a whim or something. He's sending them out to go and gather intel, to scout the lands. And notice that especially Jericho. It's really highlighting its importance as a city. It was really heavily fortified. And what happens? The spies obey. 
It's a real contrast to numbers so far. But then in verse 2, we get one of quite a few sort of plot twists, if it was a spy novel. They arrive at Jericho at the house of Rahab the prostitute. And you might be thinking, well, why here? It's quite likely that this would have been a tavern or an inn or something. So if you think about it, if you're a spy going into a brand new location, probably that's quite a good place to go and find stuff out without alerting too much suspicion. There's lots of people coming and going and traveling. We'll also see probably the biggest reason why they're there later on. But the writer in Joshua doesn't reveal that to us yet. Instead, we keep getting specific details revealed to us in a certain order. It's creating more tension in the story because then at the end of verse 2, the king of Jericho finds out about the spies. And what does he do? He sends men to go and see Rahab in verse 3. It seems the spies are going to get caught. But there's another twist. Look at verse 4. But the woman had taken the two men. Rahab's hidden the spies and doesn't give their location away in verse 5 when she talks to the king's men. We don't truly, though, know what's going on until verse 6 because the spies are actually hiding on the roof of Rahab's house. And this is really big because this is somebody, this is a non-Israelite, effectively a Gentile, which is a word for non-Jewish, helping God's people. The spies have probably gone to Jericho expecting hostility. And what do they find? They find help seemingly from the enemy. And there's often discussion here over the Rahab being a prostitute and the spies staying there. But the original text in the Hebrew simply says, stay there, and it doesn't say anything else. It doesn't seem as if that's the reason why they're going there. It's different to, for example, in Judges 16, when Samson spends the night with a prostitute. And in short, it's not the main focus of the passage here. The writer would surely spend more time talking about it if it was. And also, it's in a similar vein, is the Bible saying here that there's exceptional conditions for lying? Because Rahab does lie. And as a fallen human, Rahab, like us, lies. It might have come quite naturally to her, but it seems, though, that the lie isn't the focus of the passage. The genre of this part of the Bible is narrative, so it's just telling us what happens. There's no reference to the lie either in the rest of the chapter. And that's the broad strokes of both those questions. If you've got more questions or want to think about that more, either come and speak to me afterwards, or at the bottom of the sheet there is a Gospel Coalition article um, which I'd really recommend going and having a read of. It actually covers the whole chapter um, but it's a really easy read and sort of answers those sort of questions in a bit more depth than we've got time for this evening. So maybe this spy thriller has been unfulfilling because we don't know the names of the spies, they haven't spied much, they don't really do much more spying for the rest of the passage, but we can't deny it's quite tense at the end of verse 7 because the agents, they get sent to go and look for the spies across so the, the road towards the Jordan, and then the gates of Jericho, look what happens. They're locked. The spies are locked in. This could get really tricky. But since we've already had that reading, we know what's about to happen. We see that it's less of a spy thriller, and we're about to get to the real part of the passage of Rahab's faith. That's our second point. God's grace in Rahab's conversion verses 8 to 14. I don't know if you have a particularly a favorite sandwich filling maybe. Um, sometimes I try and get um, a meal deal for lunch which I failed to do I think on Wednesday this week because the co-op down the road had no sandwiches which was not very good at all. But it's a bit like a sandwich in this chapter of Joshua 2 because 
There we go. There's a nice sandwich. We have sort of verse 1 and then verse 22 to 24. So like the bits about Joshua that have Joshua in at the start and right at the finish. Then we have your sort of tomato or your lettuce. So the bit we've just looked at. And then verses 15 to 21. And then this is the best part of the passage. It's like you're sort of the meat or the halloumi, depending on your sandwich outlook. And Rahab has already come into the story and has done a few unexpected things, I think, to help the spies. But now it goes up another gear because she professes faith. Look at verse 9. She says, I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. And this is crazy, right? This isn't an Israelite saying this. This is Rahab from Jericho saying this, from the enemy. She seems to have heard a lot about the Israelites as well. Look at verse 10. We get a mention of the Red Sea crossing in Exodus when God saves the Israelites from the Egyptian army. And then that bit about Sion and Og is another reference to a previous battle. We can read about it in Numbers 21 where those cities are destroyed by Israel because God has given those cities over to the Israelites. But despite that sort of one-verse history lesson, I suppose you could call it, verse 11 shifts the verse, the focus, back onto God. We get more of that reaction because when we, i.e. Jericho, heard of it, our hearts sank or an alternative translation, if you look at the church Bibles there with the, under the little C, it says, melted in fear again. Because the Lord your God is God in heaven and earth. It's almost like we've got that sandwich in the whole chapter. And then we've got like a sandwich within a sandwich of like verse 9, verse 10, and then verse 11. And the focus of that starts and finishes with who God is. We're reading an Old Testament testimony of Rahab coming to faith in God on account of hearing who he is, what he's done through the Israelites. And then in verse 11, Rahab truly recognizes who God is. It's like if Rahab was coming to like a breakfast or like a Thai beach party or something, this, these three verses would be like her testimony or like her speech bit of how she came to find God. And God's grace is undoubtedly at work here. God has been working in the heart of Rahab as she's heard about what God's people have been up to. And now she's sharing her testimony with the two spies. Rahab confesses what God has already done to redeem his people. And that is what brings salvation. Rahab ultimately is drawn into God's family because we know from elsewhere in the Bible that she marries a man called Salmon. They have a son called Boaz. Boaz, who's married Ruth, Ruth is a descendant of David, and then David, many, many years later, down the line comes Jesus. Despite not being an Israelite, God is drawing a non-Israelite to him, who ultimately comes into the family line of Jesus. And the great thing is that God is still willingly drawing people to him of every nation anyone who's coming willing to admit who God is and what he's done on the cross God willingly welcomes into his care Paul assures us of this in Romans 10 verse 9 which I'll read out if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved And maybe you're here tonight and you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, which is absolutely fine. It's great that you're here. And there's others in that position this evening. 
But God is still the same God of this passage, is still the same God today. God still wants to draw others into his care, like Rahab. Through the work of Jesus on the cross, it's even more glorious. Unlike in Joshua, we know that God's work is ultimately finished. And that same offer made to Rahab extends to you as well. God's offer is still there. But for us, quickly, if we're Christians, we've also got a similar story of how God has worked in our lives, haven't we? We can normally pinpoint that in some way because we've all got some sort of testimony, however dramatic or undramatic, of how we became Christians. Though for us now, it's not sort of through seeing the Red Sea crossing. It's through Jesus' death on the cross. That's what brings us to God. And so we should be ready, I think, to share that story with others too, like how Rahab is in this passage, whether that's with non-Christians, but it's often actually really good to share it with other Christians. It's so encouraging. And if you're a bit unsure, a bit uncertain about where to start, then trying it out with Christians first is really good. It's really good to encourage one another. Rahab's confession of who God is as much as the spies hadn't expected it, becomes hugely encouraging, knowing that there's someone in Jericho on their side as well. And so we shouldn't underestimate how encouraging our story of coming to faith can be either. So then our third point, God's protection in the escape We've still kind of got half the spy thriller to go to find out what happens. And this is where God's protection for the spies and for Rahab really kicks in in verses 15 to 21. Because if you think about it, the spies, they're basically on the roof still. They've got two problems, I think. They've got to get out of Jericho because we've got the doors into the city are still locked. And when they get out, they've got those agents from Jericho looking for them. And remember how Joshua 2 is written in that really specific order. And look in verse 15. This is the biggest reason why the spies are there, because the house that Rahab lives in is on the city wall of Jericho. It's like right on the edge. It's like the toffee of the Banoffee pie. It's the most important part, I think. It's the most important reason of all for the spies to be here. And we haven't known about that as the readers before. So they've got that escape route. And we can assume that the information in verses 16 to 21 probably took place, that conversation, after they were let out. So it's not so much in the order that it's here. It's not so much that they're let out and then Rahab's up there from a window and like the spies are down here sort of like shouting this conversation out so it's really blatantly obvious. But notice the had in verse 17. This conversation has taken place almost prior to the rope. But it's a vital agreement. God uses Rahab to tell them where to go and stay away from the agents as well. Look at verse 16. Rahab tells them to go to the hills so that the pursuers will not find you, to hide yourselves for three days and then go on your way. God's protecting the spies, but he's doing it through quite an unusual way because he's using Rahab's local knowledge of the best places to hide. God doesn't stop there. God's grace in bringing Rahab to faith means she will get protection from God as well. And she kind of has these sort of three contractual agreements. I don't know, like sportsmen, sportswomen, when they sign a contract they often have quite specific clauses in. And Rahab has them here, I guess. Verses 18 to 20, she's got to tie the scarlet cord in the window. She's got to gather her family to be saved in her house. And then the third one is to not tell anyone what the spies are doing. And Rahab agrees to this in verse 21. This is a massive risk for Rahab She could easily, even after the start of the chapter, be having second thoughts here. By agreeing to this, Rahab is really going against her own people 
against her own culture, against the worship of the many gods in Jericho, and the threat of treason from the authorities. And it's very similar to the persecuted church today. I could get a brochure from Open Doors. We were thinking about that last week in the morning service. And it's similarly high risk for some of our brothers and sisters across the world. And yet Rahab does it because she knows who God is. It's the same God ruling today. So we should be encouraged as well as we pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters. So Rahab agrees to that contractual agreement. The spies are on their way. They're out of Jericho. So God's provided for both of them. And then the final point, what's the result? Well, the result is God's faithfulness. Last three verses there, verse 22. God's ultimately faithful to his promises. Verse 22, they went into the hills, stayed there three days, until the pursuers had searched all along the road and returned without finding them. The spies hide, and look what happens. They aren't caught. The spies from Jericho get back to Jericho without finding them. And no matter how good or how camouflaged those two spies had hidden, God's protection is ultimately faithful here. God's protection in his faithfulness is that ultimate hiding spot. And Rahab's part of the promise is also kept as well. But you'll have to come back in about a month's time when we look at Joshua chapter 6 for that to be fulfilled. But it does happen. And God's faithfulness to his people is there in the spies' report. Look at verse 24. For a report, it's not very much. The Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. And there's a parallel. You might be thinking, that sounds quite familiar. Aren't you just reading verse 9? And the answer is, that is very true. Because those two verses are very, very similar if you compare the two verses together. Ultimately, the spies haven't done much spying but they come back with their report, which is Rahab's confession of faith. It's that ultimate confirmation of who God is, his grace in giving the land into their hands. It's the same faithful God to them as the God at the Red Sea crossing. They have that amazing assurance And it's a massive contrast to the last time that Joshua was involved in a spying mission. And then there's the case of Rahab as well. Rahab comes back, as we've kind of hinted, in Joshua 6. And then her faith is picked up on in the New Testament as well. James writes in his letter, this is James 2 verse 25... Was not even Rahab considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and then sent them off in a different direction? Now, James, we don't have time to unpack all of that, but James is using Rahab's example to emphasize his point that faith needs to be active. In other words, faith without works is dead. We can read here in Joshua 2 what her response to God's faithfulness is because she uses her situation within Jericho to help the spies. That's her faith being active. It's how she's helping in her context to advance God's kingdom. So if we're Christians here tonight, what does that look like for us? As New Testament Christians, we've got the full context of the cross, the resurrection. We need to look as well to help grow God's kingdom in our own situations. It's not necessarily having conversations with Norton Christians all the time, as much as that's really good. It could be something like in this chapter, something much more subtle and everyday than that. It could be something like in the workplace, making sure as much as we can that every Christian influence that still exists 
is still allowed to function. Or it could be something different. It could be offering to host our house group for a week when the usual venue is unavailable. But God's faithfulness ultimately is at work throughout this whole passage. And that's why it's here in between Joshua 1 and Joshua 3. God's grace is what brings Rahab to him. It's what allows anyone now to come through the work of the cross to him. No one is too far away from God's power to save. No one is too far away. The same God whose protection and faithfulness at work in this chapter works in and through us as Christians today. So as we finish, this chapter does seem quite random at a first glance, but we've seen that ultimately God is faithful throughout while his offer of grace is on offer to literally anyone who acknowledges him as Lord. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you are a faithful God. Thank you that your grace brought Rahab to faith in you. Thank you that you're still the same faithful God to us now. Amen. Thanks, Jacob. Um, could we put our verse on the screen again, Catherine? Yes, there it is. The same faithful God. Um, let's say this, this time with the words. Next time we say it, we know words. So it's good to kind of get it going. Um, and then we're going to launch into our, 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 our last song, Great is Thy Faithfulness, singing about that faithful, brilliant God. So let's stand, say this together, then we'll sing. Let's stand up. Not one of all the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled.
singing. Grab a seat. Um, that's Rahab's like, anthem, isn't it? Like after the events of Joshua 2, that's what she had been singing. Great is thy faithfulness to God. New mercies I see. She would have been belting that out. Um, we come to kind of the, the, the close of our formal time together. Just a few things to flag up. Um, first up, uh, on the 4th and 5th of June, big things are happening in the life of a church family. On the 4th, we've got a, a jubilee celebration kind of event uh, here at the church. Um, we're really excited about it, and we love people to get involved in that. Uh, you can make some fantastic-looking bunting. Look at these. Oh, lovely. Oh. Um, there's like a box at the back of... Uh, Pink, pink. These are purple, purple. The, the, the Queen's colours, royal colours. And purple triangles to decorate, uh, at, so we can make this place look beautiful and brilliant and a real celebratory feel. Um, you can also get involved. Um, there's a list at the back of things that we'd love people to kind of come and help in. Um, Jane and the team are doing a brilliant job organising this thing. We'd love to make it a real brilliant blessing for the community where we can meet people, have people coming in here and hearing about the faithful Queen uh, who loves a faithful God. So do kind of put your name down for things, get involved there um, and be praying for it too that's a really big and important thing to do um, there are invites not in my pocket um, there are invites that are purple uh, hanging around the church grab some of those give them up to people you know as well um, let's make it a real special day on the Sunday then we've got two different services that are going to be slightly different um, more kind of monarch themed um, kind of thinking about the faithful queen and the faithful god that she serves um, they're brilliant events to invite friends along to too before that, well, well tomorrow, um, it, it's Ian Barclay's Thanksgiving service starting at two o'clock. Um, do come and join us. Uh, he, he was a, a man who loved the Lord Jesus, and we want to give thanks to God for him and his life and the work that he did. So come and join us, and we advise you to come early because we think it's going to be absolutely packed. Um, so come along and join us for that. But also, if you could help now, so after we're finished praying, could you grab some chairs and help pack the chairs in so we can get more people in here to celebrate and give thanks for Ian's life? Um, that would be fantastic. But let's say our verse together, then I'll pray, and then we'll move some chairs. This time, no aid on the screen. A real memory verse. Um, let's give this a go. <laughs> <laughs> Not one of all the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. Father, thank you that you are a faithful God who keeps all his promises. Thank you that Rahab learned how faithful a God you were, uh, that you kept your promises to her. Uh, Father, as we go into our week, as we go into whatever it holds, would we remember that you are a faithful God who is true and good to every promise you've made to us. Amen.